Hey Solid Ground, we are Justin and Meg Savini. This is Nathan and Olive, and uh, we want to welcome you or wish you a happy Advent. This is week one, and today's topic will be on peace. I will be reading from the book of Isaiah 2 and then 6 through 7. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from the time forth, from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And now we're going to light our Advent candle. We hope that one works work better. <laughs> Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Well, good morning, everybody, and big thank you to Justin and Megan and the kids for reading us our Advent passage today. Guys, uh, so glad you're tuning in to church online today. If we haven't met, my name's Bert. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm really excited to begin a brand new series with you today called Advent. Now, you might be like, well, what the heck is Advent? Well, Advent uh, comes, or the English word Advent comes from the, the Latin word Adventus, which means coming or arrival. And it's just about the Christmas season, going into Christmas itself, and it sort of reflects on the arrival of Jesus the first coming of Jesus, and then as we reflect on that, we start to anticipate and get more excited about um, when he returns. And so usually at Advent, there's uh, four sort of key Advent themes. We talk about peace, we talk about hope, joy, and lastly, love. And we'll be doing that in this series. And I'm excited today to talk with you about peace because I think, number one, man, how many of us just need some peace in our lives? You know, this past week, I came across uh, a Gallup poll back from 2019. This was done, so pre-COVID, and basically what they did was they surveyed 150,000 people all over the world to test them for their levels of stress, just to see, you know, were they feeling overwhelmed, were they feeling like they had too much on their plate? And shock of shocks, who should it turn out to be the most stressed people in the world? But us, Americans. It turns out we're more stressed than anybody. And, and uh, you know, I, I got to tell you, like, maybe as I'm saying that, you're like, duh. You know, you, how many of us, like, we go through life and you, maybe this is where you are. Like, within the last week, you felt overwhelmed on multiple occasions. I know I have. And, and I got to even say that to talk about peace. I feel like, for me, it's the, the pot calling the kettle black. Like, I feel like I'm the least equipped guy to talk about peace and tranquility and, and, and what have you because I'm a guy who gets stressed very easily. I, you know, I, I hate to admit that, but it's very true. You know, like they talk about some people being optimists and others being pessimists. And, you know, maybe you, you've heard of that idea of like, you know, somebody will say like the glass is half full and somebody else will be like, no, the, the glass is half empty. I'm a guy who if I saw the glass, I'd be like, oh, man, is that a smudge on the glass? Man, I got to clean the glass now. And oh, man, that might be a crack. I, I have to go buy a new glass because I see a crack on it. Like that's, that's who I am. So to talk about peace, I, I just got to tell you, I feel like I'm not the guy. And yet, um, you know, maybe what will happen is as we both dig into the Word together, we see what God has to say about it. Uh, we'll, we'll all sort of come out of this being like, okay, you know, I feel a little bit built up, and, and, and I feel like I can go forward um, into peace as we explore uh, th this theme. And so to just begin, it's interesting because when, when you go into the Bible, what you find is primarily under the idea of peace— um, there, there are two words that are mostly used. In the Old Testament, it's the word shalom. And in the New Testament, it's the word erene. Uh, so you get the Hebrew word shalom and the Greek word erene. And, uh, you know, I always, it's a fun fact for you. Uh, when, when I was in school and I was having to memorize my, my Old Testament, New Testament uh, words, you know, when it came to erene in, in New Testament, I would, for whatever reason, I'd be like, you know what? Erene rhymes with hairspray. Um, you won't have a bad hair day if you have peace. And so I was just, that's how I, I remembered Irene, uh, this, this idea of, of peace. And, and I know that's dumb, but now hopefully it'll stick with you as well. But it's, it's a needed thing, because I think a lot of us, when it comes to how we understand peace in the Bible, um, 
what it is is we, we sort of had this misunderstanding because we think it, it is purely about like an ending of hostilities or a lack of conflict, right? And how many of us, like even if, if I'm talking about peace right now, you're like, all right, you know, just like save the hippie thing, right? Because we hear the word peace and we picture like John Lennon and, and, and you know, that's sort of like anything for peace, you know, type deal. And we're like, I, I, I have better things to do. But something to understand about peace when it comes to the, the Bible is, is this. And if you're taking notes, I just want you to write this down, okay? Biblical peace has to do with completeness. Let me say that again. Biblical peace has to do with completeness. It's not just about like, you know, that there not being a conflict or feeling like, you know, sort of tranquil. It, it's bigger than that. It. it has to do with life being complete. Like to sort of understand that like the biblical authors, um, when, when they view life, they view life as this sort of complex machine with all these different components and parts. It's kind of like um, when I was a kid, I, was, I have this vivid memory of going somewhere. I don't remember where, maybe probably a, a relative's, and, and see this giant like grandfather clock. You ever been to somebody's house and you see this big grandfather clock? And usually, sometimes they have like that big glass front. So you see all the mechanisms, right? Like all the gears, you know, twisting and the pendulum swinging back and forth and maybe some chimes hanging down. You had all these things working together and they all form this grand, grandfather clock. And, and if you were to sort of take one of those gears out or break one of those gears, the whole thing would shut down because it's this complex machine. In, in the same way, when it comes to life, the biblical authors would, would look at life and be like, listen, life isn't just one thing. It's, it's all these different things working together at once. So whether that be health, whether that be, uh, whether that be sort of mental uh, peace, whether that be relationships, whether that be success, whether that be, you know, enjoying time with your kids or your job, like whatever. It's like all these different things. And to them, that's life. And, and what, what shalom is, like the, the Hebrew word, is it has to do with this idea of all of those things being complete and all of those things working together. And, and, and so you find this word, and sometimes it's used to talk about like an end of war, but so often it's just so bigger than that. So for instance, okay, um, there's a passage in, in Genesis 15, 15, where, where when, when God uh, speaks to Abraham and makes a covenant with him, he says this, he says, you, however, will go to your ancestors in, and look at this word, peace, and be buried at a good old age. And what he's talking about there is this idea of, of peace as rest. Like, hey, you're not going to have to strive anymore. You're not going to have to worry about any of that. Like, you're going to live a long, healthy life. And then when you're done, you'll rest with your ancestors. And, and so, it, it, again, it's not about a lack of war or a lack of fighting. It, it has to do with this sort of inner peace. But it doesn't stop there. Sometimes it has to do with safety, so uh, you go forward in the Old Testament, there's a story of this guy, King David, right? Maybe you've read the story of David. You know, David was the second king of Israel. Uh, God calls him and says, you know, I'm going to make you king to replace the first king, this guy named Saul. And as you can imagine, Saul didn't take very kindly to that. And so Saul wanted to kill David. And you reach this point early in David's life where David, he's best friends with, with Saul's son, Jonathan. And he's telling him, listen, your dad's trying to kill me. And Jonathan's saying, listen, I won't let that happen to you. And this is what it says in uh, 1 Samuel 20, verse 13. This is Daniel, or Jonathan saying to David, he says, but should it please my father to do you harm? The Lord do so to Jonathan and more also, if I do not disclose it to you and send you away, that you may go in safety. In other words, Jonathan is saying, listen, um, may, may it fall on me if I don't tell you if, if your dad or if my dad's going to do something to you. And he says uh, that you leave in safety. And this word safety, it's the same word, shalom. Yeah, but why? Well, because, because, you know, sin or evil or harm, these are all a lack of completeness. These are all a lack of, of God's sort of nature in creation. And so in this context, shalom can mean safety, but it doesn't even stop there. I mean, you find this idea, when we're talking about this sort of big overarching idea of peace, shalom can also mean fullness, like, like not lacking anything. So for instance, there's a story when the Israelites come into the promised land, and Joshua goes to make this altar uh, to the Lord. Here's what it says in, in Joshua 8.31. It says, Joshua built it, I'm talking about the altar, according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar, and look at this here, of uncut stones. And this word that we translate as uncut is actually shalom. It's shalom, like complete stones. Meaning, um, here are things, like there's no part of that stone that's lacking, like it's all there. Why? Because, because shalom has to do with this idea of everything just sort of being as it should be in every single 
place. I mean, we, we could go on. Shalom doesn't just have to do with, uh, like, you know, fullness. It also, uh, I mean, or, or like in terms of rocks, it can also mean uh, fullness in terms of like your reward. So there's a story uh, later on where in, in the book of Ruth, where, you know, if you know the story of Ruth, Ruth, uh, she was married, her husband died, and then uh, Ruth, who was not an Israelite, stuck with her uh, mother-in-law, Naomi, who was. And she goes to work, and this guy named Boaz hears about how she's been like so faithful to her mother-in-law, and in, uh, and he and he views that as like just a really really it's an indicator of great character. And in Ruth two twelve, he says this: "This is what Boaz says to her: The Lord repay you for what you've done, and and look at this: a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel." Um, and, and that word that we translate full reward, like full, it's shalom. In other words, hey, like, like, let no part of your reward be lacking. Let no component of the money that's due you or the, the, or the, the, the happiness, or like, let none of that be absent. Why? Well, because shalom, this idea of peace, has to do with completeness. I mean, we, we can go on. We can see it used to talk about physical wellness. Like back in Genesis, you know, after there's a story where Joseph, you know, his brother sold into slavery and he's, and, and he's restored to them and he's asking them about their dad, like their, you know, common dad. And this is what he says in Genesis uh, 43, 27. He says, he asked them how they were and then said, how is your aged father? Uh, you told me about, is he still living? Okay. And we're talking about like, you know, sort of ask this one, how they are or how is it with you? It's that word shalom again. Like, how's your physical health? How's, how's your mental health? Is it good? Are you healthy? I mean, you find David doing this all the time in, in uh, First and Second Samuel. Like, he'll ask his brothers how they are. He'll ask guys in his army. Um, because why? Well, because shalom, like we're talking about healing and health. Well, that's part of completeness. It's part of the clock all working together. I mean, we find shalom um, in this idea of peace. It, it's not just uh, that aspect. It also has to do with restoring things and, and making up where things have fallen apart or lack. So there's this uh, book in the Old Testament called Nehemiah, where this guy, after the city of Jerusalem is ransacked, this guy Nehemiah, he feels called to go back and rebuild the city walls, which is their, their primary defense. And so when the project is done, here's what Nehemiah 6.15 says. It says, so the wall was completed on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. And that word that we translate as completed is shalom. Like that the wall's not lacking any stone, that it's together as it should be. Why? Well, because biblical peace has to do with the completeness uh, and fulfillment of things. That, and, and you might go, okay, well, well, why is it so important? Well, because sometimes when things are lacking, everything falls apart. And, and the crazy part is we just, as we look into the, the nature of creation, is, is as we look at the world, we discover that it's not as it should be, right? I mean, there's something in all of us that we look at things and then we try to explain it different ways. So, you know, if people just get their stuff together, things would be better in our lives. So we think, but we don't understand um, that nobody can get their stuff together because, every, because all of us are broken um, because there's a, there's a crucial component missing, even though all these other great things are there. It's kind of like this. Um, a little while back, my transmission went bad on my car. If you can believe that or not. Like, I was driving, and then one day, I'm pushing the gas, you know, and nothing's happening. <laughs> I sort of coasted into my neighborhood, and I'm revving this engine, and my neighbors could hear me sounding like I'm driving something horrible, but, but just nothing's happening. And the crazy part is this. Listen, my, most of the other parts of my car were intact. Like, I still had a steering wheel, still had a stereo. I still had a gas pedal. just wasn't working because there was this crucial component that was not there. And as you go into the, the, the Bible story, what you discover is that creation is lacking a crucial component uh, in the way that it exists as well. Namely, uh, and this is why there's a, there's a, a breaking of shalom, uh, namely it's missing the ruling of God. Genesis 3 tells us this story of our first parents, Adam and Eve, who were charged with the care of creation and representing, like being sort of middle management to creation under the king, God, and they chose to rebel against him. They chose, and representing all of us, to want things to be done their way. And as a result of that, creation broke right? I mean, if you read the story beforehand, it talks about Adam and Eve's relationship and how it says they were naked and they felt no shame. Like there's nothing like going between the two of them. There's just complete trust. But right after they, they choose to rebel against God, they're, like relational rifts abound, you know? So you find, uh, you find 
uh, Adam, and, and it says, like, he immediately just turns on his wife. He's like, it was her fault, you know. And, and then, oh, and also, God, it's kind of your fault that I did this. And um, you find Eve, and it, and it says that, you know, she's going to basically have this unhealthy dependence on her husband now. And you, you find Adam being affected so that, okay, where there was peace uh, before and wholeness, well, the sh- like the shalom's been disrupted. And so now he's going to work uh, by the sweat of his brow all the days of his life till he dies, you know. I mean, like all of it, it, it breaks. And then the, the immediate next thing that you see in the next chapter is their, their kid, uh, Cain, he actually kills, he murders one of their other kids, Abel. Why? Well, because peace has been removed. Shalom has been broken because here's the truth. And if you're taking this, maybe you just need to write this down today. Rejecting God creates a lack of shalom. Rejecting God, the author of peace, the author of life, like when you reject him, what happens is uh, you lose all those sort of things that are associated with his character. And, and, and so that actually leads us to the passage that Justin and Megan read earlier. Because as we look at this broken creation, as we look at how, man, the world just is not as it should be, there's this prophecy that comes out that God won't, won't leave it that way forever. Even though we've rejected him, even though like, we haven't wanted him and his way of things, that, that someday God would set it right. And so you find about 800 years before Jesus, there's this guy named Isaiah. He's a prophet, lives in Jerusalem, and sort of the, the big message of the beginning of the book of Isaiah is simply this. Hey guys, people of Israel, you've re- been rebelling against God, and now it's going to catch up with you. And so like that's it. And in the middle of all this sort of prophecy, hey, you're going to be ransacked and all these things, are gonna, these terrible things are going to happen. It's almost like it's, uh, Isaiah just kind of pauses and he looks to the future beyond the thing that he's prophesying about. And he starts to talk about this guy, this, 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 this ruler. Remember, again, remember like, like our first parents and us, uh, we've rejected the rule of God, but one day God would bring a ruler. One day God would, would bring somebody, a new Adam, so he would step into creation and, and restore Shalom. He, he would make it all right. He would bring back the completeness, the peace, the healing, the health, the fullness, these things that we've rejected, okay? And this is what Isaiah chapter 9 verse 5 says. It says, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. In other words, um, there's going to come a time where war is obsolete. There's going to come a time where, okay, all this battle gear is gone. And everybody's going, why? And Isaiah says, I'll tell you why, okay? Because, and this is verse six, for unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. I mean, there's gonna be this person who's gonna set it right. It says, and he will be called, and I mean, okay, like, remember with Bible names, names aren't just sounds that you make. These are, these are representations of a person's character. We talk about this a lot at our church, okay? He will be called mighty counselor, or sorry, he will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, he'll be called God, This guy, like a human being? Yeah, he'll be called God. He'll be called Everlasting Father. And look at this phrase, Prince of Peace or Prince of Shalom. (laughs) In other words, he will be someone who rules with the the restoration of creation. And it says, and of the greatness of his government, and there's our word again, peace. There will be no end. He will bring a kingdom in shalom. He will heal all that's wrong with the world. He, and everything has been broken by the fall. And that's why as you go to the New Testament now, right, and, and, and you look at um, th- this brand new idea of Jesus arriving on the scene, when you look at the Christmas stories, pay attention to how Jesus' birth is announced. It's not just announced as a king, but a very specific kind of king. Like think about the, sort of the, the story of the shepherds in the wilderness in, in Luke 2, where you know, like the angels, they appear, maybe like you've heard of it, right? Like the angels, they show up and they, and they, um, they announce from heaven the birth of the king. And here's what the angels say in Luke 2, 14. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Look at that word. Peace. Peace. Now it's there, ain't But same concept. Peace. To those on whom his favor rests. It's peace in the fullest sense. It's not just peace as a feeling. No, it's better than a feeling. Sometimes for most of us, like, we want peace only as a feeling because we think, you know, I just want to feel better. But man, here's, the, here's why we need peace that's greater than a feeling. Because feelings change all the time. Feelings can change based on what we ate and how much sleep that we had. Feelings are fickle. We need peace that's a reality. We need peace as a, 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 as a stamp on who we actually are. 
Uh, think of it like this. You know, I, I have a couple kids, and every now and then my kids, they get a little bit moody, as all of us do. They could take that from their old man, I guess. And, um, and they'll say things that they don't mean, but they're so caught up in the moment that they believe it, you know. So, you know, oh, I hate you, right? Like you have a kid having a temper tantrum, or, oh, I wish you weren't my dad, or, you know, you ever have that one? Well, here's the crazy part. It doesn't matter what they wish. I still am their dad. Why? Because my relationship with them is more solid than how they feel. In the same way, when we talk about the peace that comes through Christ, we're talking about peace that's greater than a feeling. We're talking about an entire mode of existence because it's the restoration of shalom. The creation has been broken, but Jesus has come to restore it. I I had a Hebrew professor say it like this in in seminary. He said, man, if you're trying to just sort of encapsulate God's entire act, activity in the Bible, like what God is after in creation, in the world with you and me. He's after the restoration of shalom. He's after the recovering of peace and healing the world. That's why Jesus says it like this as he grows up in John 14, 27. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I don't give you peace as the world does. In other words, listen, like there, there are other kinds of pieces that you can encounter in the world. Like you can feel a certain kind of peace or maybe there's like peace like treaties. You know, there, there are countries at war and they sign documents to end hostilities. But the crazy thing about trees are trees don't change hearts. Trees don't transform people into new people. They're just agreements to, to, like, to, to end a hostility. And Jesus goes, I don't give peace like that. I don't give peace that could be here one day and then gone tomorrow. No, no, I give you my peace. And then, okay, and we, we, what, what's his peace? Well, his peace is his completeness. His peace, his peace is his character represented in, in our relationship with God. Like because of Jesus' cross and resurrection, Jesus died for our sin. Okay, so he died to, to wipe away the brokenness of our lack of shalom. He took the fullness of the brokenness of creation, the fullness of hostility on himself to give you and me the fullness of shalom, to give us the fullness of peace. It's why... That's why Paul reflects on this, and he writes this in Romans 5.1. He says, therefore, since we have been, and I love this word, we, we cover this all the time, this word justified through faith. And what that word literally means is declared righteous. That like God, like with a legal pronunciation, we have been declared righteous. We've been given a standing with God. Since we have been justified through faith, we have, look at that word, peace with God. Through who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. In other words, through Jesus, we are not lacking anything in our relationship with God. Our relationship with God has been restored to wholeness. Why? Because Jesus has given us his. Jesus has, he, he's come into the world as the prince of peace, the, the restorer of creation. Because you and I, like, because of sin and because of our first parents, that relationship with God was broken. Think back to Genesis 3, what happens right after the man and woman sin? They go and they hide. They, they, they distance themselves from God. But now because of Jesus, there is no distance between us and God because he's given us his blamelessness. Jesus' entire relationship with God has been given to you and me. It's why Paul writes this in Ephesians 2.14. He says, for he himself, talking about Jesus, is our peace. He's our completeness. He's our standing with God. And Paul reflects on this and and, and he talks about like how Jesus has done this, even among people groups. In Ephesians 2.14, continuing, he says, like he who is our peace, who has made the two groups one, destroying the barrier. And he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. There used to be people who were a covenant relationship with God and those who weren't. But now all of us have been brought together under him. So this dividing the wall of hostility. By how? By setting aside his flesh and the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making, and there's that word, peace, that there wouldn't be hostility between human beings anymore, that no, we would be one people in him for those of us who have received him. And in one body, he says, verse 16, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. And how do you do that? And I love this just for you and for me, those of us who are Gentiles, okay? And that's just non-Jewish person, okay? He came and preached, and there's our word, peace to you who are far away and peace uh, to those who are near. In other words, hey, listen, when we were not even pursuing God, when we were just sort of doing our own thing, Jesus came and he said, I'm gonna give you what you were designed for. I'm gonna give you relationship restoration. I'm gonna make it so that in your relationship with God, you are not lacking 
anything. Think back to this big idea of shalom that we've covered. Like when we talk about this idea, okay, in our relationship with God, what this means, listen, we're not lacking well-being. He says, I'm giving you my well-being, okay? We're not lacking hope because he says, I'm giving you my hope. We're not lacking anything spiritual. We're not lacking healing. We're not lacking fullness. Why? Because Jesus is our arene. He's our shalom. He's our completeness. If you want to understand who Jesus is and why we rest on his peace this Christmas, it's really, really simple, okay? Because Jesus is who we were made to be but failed to be. And he gives us his life in relationship with God as a gift. Let me say that again. Jesus is who we were made to be, but failed to be. And all of us have failed to be who we were made to be. And what he does is he gives us his status, his relationship, his life with God as a gift. It's free. If you can imagine being at a track meet, you know, and you got that guy like who sort of takes off running and he wins the race. Imagine like you're sitting in the stands and you see some guy and he kills on the race and he walks, takes his medal or his trophy and he walks up to you in the stand and hands you the trophy, hands you the medal. That's what Jesus has done for us. He's given us his reward, his faithfulness and his standing with God, his completeness, his peace is now ours in him. Guys, this is why we're called sons and daughters of God. Why? Because Jesus is the son of God and he's given us his relationship with God. That's, that's your entire identity if you're in Christ. And you go, okay, so like what does that mean? Oh, it means all kinds of things. Listen, do you, do you know why I know I'm completely forgiven in Christ? Because of Jesus' status. Because Jesus had no sin. And so therefore, if Jesus had no sin, there's nothing to hold against me because Jesus has given me his relationship with God. There's nothing to hold against Christ, okay? Do you know how I know that God loves me and how I know he loves you? Because the Father loves Jesus. That's how I know that, right? Because at Jesus' baptism, the, the voice comes down from heaven that says, this is my beloved son, my beloved. And so he says it for you as well if you're in Christ. Listen, like you don't have to question if God loves you because you know that God loves Jesus and Jesus has given that to you. Okay, well, how do I know that God is pleased with me? Well, okay, beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Because I'm in Christ, I know that there's nothing in my life that I have to do to make God happy. I don't have to worry about stepping on God's toes. Why? Because as happy as God can be made, Jesus has already done for me and for you. And he's given that to us. <laughs> how, 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 like, like, why do I know that I don't have to fear bitterness or resentment or distance from God? So if I screw it up, God's like, I would have brought you in, but now I'm not going to. If you'd lived a little bit better, if you'd done it uh, like a little more faithful, if, if you had, you know, achieved these things, if you were just a better version of you, why do I know I don't have to ever fear that kind of distance from God? Well, because there is no distance from the Son to the Father. Jesus has lived the human life perfectly and he's given me that standing. And the only time there was ever, just check this, the only time there was ever distance between the son and the father was when the son was dying to remove the thing that created distance from us to the father. When Jesus was forsaken on the cross, it was to remove the distance to begin with. So now we don't have to have it. Why do I know that God hears me when I pray? Well, because the prayers of the Son are ridiculously answered in the Gospels, aren't they? To the point, man, there's this part in, 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 uh, where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's crucified. And, uh, you know, think about, like, he, there's this point where Jesus says, listen, like, it, don't you think that if I wanted to, I could call my Father right now. And he said, 12 legions of angels to help me. And his point is, listen, I'm exactly where I should be. I'm going to do exactly what I should do. I'm going to allow myself to be captured. But just check about that, okay? Like, if Jesus, like, if Jesus had called for a way out, if he had said, like, Father, send these angels to get me out of this, I just want to point out, okay, that would have been him completely shirking his mission from God. And yet he had no doubt that the Father would take care of him. And if that's true of Jesus, if he was saying, listen, okay, if I walk away from God's mission, he still hears me. It's true of you. Am I, am I saying you should walk away from God's mission for you? No. That's how heard you are by God. Why do I know that God will take care of my needs? Um, because Jesus never starved. <laughs> and and he, he, man, he went out on that. He chose not even to have a house. Well, okay, what does that mean? It means that God will take care of your needs as well because you have been given the status of relationship with 
Christ. Hey, how about this one? Come on, let me just say it. How do you know that God's with you when you suffer? Well, because as it turns out, like if we were to look at the suffering of Jesus, it turns out that was a mo- like you would look at that and you'd be like, oh man, like, like if ever there had been somebody who God didn't like, and yet as it turns out, it wasn't God's greatest distance, it was God's greatest faithfulness to humanity, okay? Like if you were to look at the cross of Christ, you'd be like, man, God has totally failed him, and yet you could not be more wrong. And if that's true with the worst thing that's ever been done, the murder of the innocent son of God, that God's faithfulness through suffering abounded, how much do you want to bet it's true for you and me as well for whatever we encounter here? Now, we know that God is with us through we suffer or when we suffer because Christ has suffered on our behalf. He remained faithful. And so it, his standing with God has been given to us. And how about this? Come on. How do I know that I'm going to go to heaven when I die? Well, I know that because heaven is the place where Jesus dwells and reigns. And so, yes, when my spirit leaves my body, I will be with him. Why? Because he's given me his place. He's given me standing with the Father that belongs only to him. Do you understand? Listen to me. Every single component of Jesus' relationship with God has been given to us through his faithfulness. Every single component. One. Why? Well, because of his peace, his completeness, his shalom, his arene, it's not lacking anything. And this is what, like, I, I pray that you understand today. When we talk about why we have complete peace with God through Jesus, it, well, it's because of Jesus' being a prince of peace. It's his character. Because here's the truth. Peace is not just what God has. It's who he is. Peace is not just what God has. It's who he is. And you know the great part is, it doesn't matter if you feel it or not. It's still yours. It doesn't matter what mood you're in. It's still yours. Every bit of standing uh, with a relationship with Christ has been given to you for free in the person of Jesus. And you can have it today. If you're in a place right now where you would say, man, I I, want to surrender my life to Christ and I'm recognizing that, you know what, I haven't been walking with him and I want that relationship with God. I want that forgiveness and I want to know the Lord and I want to to experience life with him. You can have it and you can have it for free because it was never about you earning it. It was about Jesus earning it for you. So today, if you'd say you want to begin a relationship with God or maybe you just want to come back, I want you to pray with me. And here's what we're going to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Lord, I believe that you sent Jesus to die for my sin and you raised him from the dead to give me new life with you. I believe Jesus is my peace, my completeness, my right standing with you. Thank you for him living the life that I never could. In this moment, I hand my life over to you. I repent of my sin. I turn from living for me. I want to know you and walk with you. Please help me do that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to Church Online this morning. Hope that you have a great rest of your first week of Advent, and we'll see you next Sunday for more of this brand new series on Advent. Bless you, and may you go in peace.